All right, hello, and welcome to Sharing Our Journey, a panel discussion about the future of hepatitis B research and the public health work necessary to prepare the world for a cure and save lives today. My name is Jean Holmes. I'm Vice President of Institutional Advancement for the Hepatitis B Foundation and the Blumberg Institute. Uh, advancement is really just a fancy way of saying I raise money for these organizations. Uh, but welcome everyone, I'm very excited. Uh, we have an audience from all over the globe today and we're thrilled to have you on the webinar today. Uh, so to begin, uh, we're gonna just uh, uh, answer some uh, a few quick housekeeping items. If you have questions um, and you'd like to ask the panelists, please put them in the chat bar and we'll try to get to everyone. If we don't answer your question during the panel discussion, we'll circle back at the end and try to get to everyone's questions. Also, if you have a specific question about your situation with hepatitis B or liver cancer, I would ask you to instead direct that question to our helpline email, which is at info at hepb.org. Um, I'll put that in the chat bar in a little bit for your reference. Um, our public health team answers about 10,000 questions every year from people all around the world. Uh, we'd be happy to address yours as well. So first off, um, I'd like to show a short video from someone very special to us. Her name is Sue Wong. She is a primary care uh, physician at RJW Barnabas Medical Center in New Jersey and is the medical director for their Center for Asian Health and Viral Hepatitis. She's also a board member of the Hepatitis B Foundation and past president of the World Hepatitis Alliance. So I'm gonna tee that up right now. Share that for you. Hi, I'm so honored to be speaking to you today about the Hepatitis B Foundation. My name is Sue Wong, and I'm a physician who takes care of people living with hepatitis B, but I'm also living with hepatitis B myself. When I was first introduced to the Hepatitis B Foundation about 15 years ago, when I was working at the Charles B. Wong Community Health Center in Chinatown, New York City, I was impressed by how the small team of passionate people was at the forefront of doing the public health research and advocacy that nobody else was doing. I was amazed at how they would call up CDC for meetings, visit with representatives and senators in Congress, and go to NIH to talk about investing in the road to hepatitis B cure. They've since created Hepatitis B United, the only national coalition of local coalitions dedicated to advancing Hepatitis B in their communities and also nationally. The work from these groups has helped to get Hepatitis B on the radar for many states who have or are creating Hepatitis B elimination plans. And every year they hold a Hill Day where they meet with congressional members. The Hepatitis B Foundation also works with top-notch scientists who are at the forefront of research across many academic institutions to work on various HEPI projects and studies. They are conveners of the doctors and experts who are doing the leading work on hepatitis B to further advance research and the cause. But what is unique is that always at the front, forefront of the is the representation of people living with hepatitis B and the communities who are most affected. It is this work that is so important. There are almost 300 million people around the world living with hepatitis B, making it the most common, common chronic infection globally. What's shocking is that only 10% of these people have been diagnosed and are aware of their infection, and thus the majority of the people are not getting care to prevent liver cancer or cirrhosis. It's hard to believe, but every 30 seconds, someone with hepatitis B dies. Despite the burden being so huge, hepatitis B has been a neglected disease. It received very little attention amongst funders, policymakers, and even public health. There's a dire need to increase general awareness of hepatitis B, and the Hepatitis B Foundation's work has been critical to growing this movement to elevate that awareness. Some of their most impactful and important work is empowering people living or affected by Hep B to tell their stories. These personal stories of people sharing how HEPI has affected their lives are so powerful and compelling. It is also so important for dispelling stigma and discrimination with HEPI, B, which has a huge burden of people on people around the world. These stories are also very effective at educating others about the disease. People are often compelled to act not by data, but by personal stories. 
I implore anybody who is living with hepatitis B like me to please consider getting involved in investing in the Hepatitis B Foundation. We need them to expand their work to improve the lives of the 300 million of us who are living with hepatitis B. Or you may not have hepatitis B, but you care about someone who does or about a community that is affected. I will also tell you that hepatitis B is a social justice and health equity issue as it disproportionately affects the marginalized populations who face barriers and do not have good access to care. It is also a maternal and health, maternal and child health issue as babies are born every day infected to hepatitis B unnecessarily because their mothers weren't tested or they didn't get a hepatitis B vaccine at birth. If you care about any of these issues, your involvement could really make a difference. We need more people who care to raise awareness and the prioritization and urgency of hepatitis B. Please consider joining people who are doing the work around you. Talk to your healthcare or government leaders or support the Hepatitis B Foundation to do so. Share information on your social media, dedicate your birthday fundraising to hepatitis B or gather a team for a race to raise money. We know these things have made a difference for so many other diseases to get the attention and resources they need. And we invite you to be a part of doing so for hepatitis B. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much to Sue Wong for that great introduction. And now I wanna, I am very proud to introduce uh, Kate Moraris, Deputy Director of Public Health for the Hepatitis B Foundation, who leads our public uh, policy and, and advocacy programs and will moderate today's panel. So I'll give it away to you, Kate. Thank you, Jane. Welcome everyone. And thank you so much for sharing your weekend with us. Um, the Hepatitis B Foundation was founded over 30 years ago. We're the only national nonprofit organization dedicated to people living with hepatitis B and representing their voices. As uh, you've just heard Dr. Wong mention, our variety of programs, outreach, education, advocacy, policy, focus on increasing hepatitis B outreach, awareness, screening, leash to care, addressing stigma and discrimination, and elevating the patient voice, and strengthening our grassroots advocacy efforts to make sure that, that hepatitis B is a public health priority in the United States and globally. Um, we have convened key stakeholders for over 30 years to make change in policy and practice to improve hepatitis B awareness, prevention, and care for people living with hepatitis B. And we're the only worldwide organization that engages directly through a consultation line with thousands of people living with hep B, learning about their challenges and needs and finding ways to help them. And as Dr. Cohen said, if you have a question during this session um, about personal treatment, medications, things like that, please feel free to reach us anytime at info at hepb.org. So now I'd like to welcome our esteemed panelists today. Um, we have Dr. Timothy Block, who is the president and founder of the Hepatitis B Foundation and the Baruch S. Blumberg Institute. Dr. Sherry Cohen, who is the senior vice president of the Hepatitis B Foundation. Dr. Jutao Goa, who is the Vice President of Research Programs and Chief Scientific Officer. He's also the W. Thomas London Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Experimental Therapeutics at the Baruch S. Blumberg Institute. And joining Dr. Goa is Dr. Blipov uh, Shrestha, who is a postdoc research fellow, and Lauren Griffith, uh, a junior research fellow at the Baruch Blumberg Institute. So we're really excited to have the foundation and the Institute's leadership with us today to share with you um, the history of the virus and of the foundation. Um, so we'll go ahead and start off uh, with Dr. Block to share with us a little bit about the history of hepatitis B. And Dr. Block, if you can briefly summarize it, what are the major breakthroughs with the hepatitis B virus since it was discovered in 1965? Thank you very much, Kate. Um, and thank you all for coming on today. And, uh, and, I, and again, as I see questions coming in the chat box, if there are questions specifically about, um, about hepatitis B and, and an individual, please do just send them to the, as Jean directed and as she, Dr. Sherry Cohen has directed, so we can answer them much more carefully. It's hard to respond to them uh, very fully right now. But uh, yeah, it's been a, a journey. This is called sharing our journey. And, and thank you all for sharing it with us. 
<clears throat> and I guess it begins in 1965 with the discovery of what was called the Australia antigen. Now we know that's hepatitis B by Baruch S. Blumberg and Tom London, and I'm not, Baruch S. Blumberg, Harvey Alter, and Sam Visnich. And, uh, and uh, I'll call your attention, we can send this, this is a promotional, but this is a paper that Harvey Alter, Tom London, uh, and, and I and Mike Bray uh, wrote on the history, basically tracking the history. So I'm prepared. I won't go into all uh, to, to the details of it, but, but you're going to see how things pick up uh, in the 2000s. So it does begin with the discovery of Australia antigen. Um, that's in 65. And then shortly after that, uh, uh, Blumberg again with London and Bruce Smith uh, made an association between that antigen and uh, that protein and actually hepatitis disease and liver cancer, that was a big one in, in the 60s. And then Blumberg and Alter developed assays to detect the virus in the blood. So then in that short period of time, the, the virus was discovered and the blood supply could be cleared. And then we jumped to the 1980s when I would say, a, a, an, and I'm gonna talk about important discoveries that are important to us here and, and, and this audience. Uh, Mason and Summers uh, d discovered how the virus really replicates and it uses that enzyme called reverse transcriptase and makes that and ultimately leads to the CCC DNA. But the reverse transcriptase um, was the basis of drugs that came later, but that was in the 1990s. But in 1991, I wanna tell you a little bit about some of our history. The Hepatitis B Foundation was started by, and uh, by, uh, yes, I, I'm a co-founder, but with my wife, Joan Block and Jan and Paul Witte. And, and uh, what I'll say about our foundation, as you're hearing about the work that we're doing, the research institute we've created, the, called the Brucas Blumberg Institute in Dr. Blumberg's honor. Uh, and and that, what I'd like you to know about the Hepatitis B Foundation is going back to 1991, um, we've stuck with Hepatitis B as our dedicated, dedicated cause and the diseases it causes through the, through the H, all very other important, huge problems in the country. Uh, HIV, we stuck with HBV. HCV, we stuck with HBV. And now with the pandemic, we've come in every day and continue to work on HBV. And of course, we're all people, so we're affected by those other things. But the Hepatitis B Foundation ha has been there through its outreach and its advocacy, and now its research. Well, uh, that's in the 1990s. Um, that uh, Some new drugs were found in the 1990s that, that target the reverse transcriptase, as I told you about, really good uh, orally available drugs. That uh, and it, that that um, now most of us, if you have hepatitis B, would have to be on it. Yeah, probably for your lives, unless unless you clear the virus on it, which is rare. But they're very effective drugs. They just require a lifelong treatment, and they only they only repress the the problem by about fifty percent, let's say. In the two thousand CCCD and oh, and I'm also going to call out when you're going to see the contributions that come from the foundation and and uh, the Blumberg Institute uh, and scientists in this. Uh, in 2000s, there was a, a lot of molecular biology advance on CCC DNA, the, uh, what the virus uses as its chromosome in the nucleus forever and in integrants. I'd credit Mason, Summers, and, and Woodall uh, uh, for that, along with Bob Gish is on one of those papers. Uh, core, core, hepatitis B core in the 2000s as a target for uh, the first really new target for hepatitis B since reverse transcriptase. Um, a lot, some of that work you can uh, take right back to um, uh, Dr. Jutao Guo here and his colleagues, including me, identifying that as a, as a target with Adam Zlotnick in another, another paper, but Jutao's lab, Dr. Guo's lab was among the first, if not the first to actually target that and come up with drugs that have formed the, uh, the basis of some clinical trials now. There are now a number of capsid inhibitors. 2010, in the 2010s, the virus receptor was discovered by, by uh, Dr. Li Wei. And then, and then shortly after that, a drug targeting the receptor by Stefan Urban was, uh, was identified, another great piece of work. Silencing RNA drugs, <clears throat> there are the rage of the 2000s. They may be the next drugs approved for hepatitis B. The first siRNAs for people was, was, was done, uh, done by Kathy Paycheck and Sati Chandran from the Hepatitis B Foundation Research Labs at that time called the IHVR in, in the, in the uh, late 90s, uh, actually in 1998. Um, so going back, but now siRNA drugs, that might be what you end up taking. Um, capsid inhibitor drugs we mentioned, uh, HBX as a target by, by Sturban is in the, is in the uh, now the 2010s, 20s. And um, 
And then finally, finally, the last thing I'd say is the uh, a whole new area of targeting hepatitis B, how its RNA is made and folded and degraded. That was originally uh, identified uh, by um, Mueller at, at, Roche, at, at Roche Pharma, but the Hepatitis B Foundation Research Labs from Tianlong Chow's laboratory uh, <clears throat> with colleagues at Arbutus determined the mechanism of action of those drugs on the virus, and we're working on new drugs right now. So um, that brings us to the present, and, and you're going to hear about some of the work done uh, from Dr. Guo and his colleagues here, you, and I hope you'll see that um, the pace has picked up for hepatitis B research in the last decade. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Block, for sharing that history. I know that was a lot, and that's a brief summary. So if anyone has any other questions about um, the virus's history or the foundation's history, feel free to share them in the chat box. Um, so, you know, we, we have seen the COVID-19 pandemic, um, everyone has, and how it's hit us globally. And things have just been fast-tracked. You know, COVID-19 had a vaccine and therapies available in a matter of months. How did that happen? And why don't we have a cure for hepatitis B after so many years? Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I will um, make a comment on that. <clears throat> I think Dr. Guo had a thought too. So, you know, <clears throat> firstly, I think the COVID crisis and the anxiety it created, it, um, it really showed what can be done when society puts its mind and effort and money into a problem. Um, no, no, no two diseases are exactly alike, but, but wow, what a miracle. And what it really taught us was that with enough investment, you can really, you can really move mountains. Um, the same principle applied to hepatitis, to hepatitis C virus. It's cured now. And it, and it, it is rel relative, in my opinion, to the amount of investment society makes, makes in that. And we've published that, the difference in, in funding for HIV for, for um, I, we've not done, uh, obviously uh, COVID would dwarf it, HCV, HIV, other diseases. Um, so more money, but it is true, and you'll hear probably from Dr. Guo that that uh, HBV is an unusually difficult refractory virus. It has to do with its molecular biology. It's a, uh, what's called a nuclear virus. It's so it goes into your cells, sits there forever. The CCC DNA, the integrants, and it paralyzes your immune system. And many of us who have been infected were infected at birth, so we're really. Uh, it, it, our immune system never really got a chance to to recognize the virus. So it's it's a challenge, but that that said, um, the investment in H HPV has just been uh, has just been a fraction of HCV, and I have no doubt that with enough uh, investment, and you're going to hear so I, I sent some great ideas from Dr. Guo and others, with enough investment, a real cure would be found sooner. I, I have no doubt about that. Good, thank you. So it's just a matter of political will, um, investment. An investment. Uh, yeah. Juto, did you want to say something about that? Dr. Gore, did you want to add something? You're on mute. You're on mute. Did you tell you're on mute? Yeah, I do uh, agree with uh, Tim that uh, you know, largely is uh, how much you actually invest it into the uh, research field. So that's, uh, uh, you know, in terms of HCV, that's, uh, you know, it's uh, largely a direct forward disease that have been, uh, you know, since the discovery up to uh, 20, uh, 30 years, you have a complete cure. And uh, of course, you know, virologically, the HBV is among the smallest virus that have been, you know, not like a COVID that was just coming to human population, we uh, witnessed. But uh, hepatitis B virus that have been co-evoluted with, uh, you know, our ancestor that in the human being have been uh, thousands uh, uh, many uh, hundreds of thousand years. So that's have found a way to how colonize uh, uh, people and they have their small gene genome in the nuclear and uh, it's very difficult to distinguish from the virus uh, uh, genome and the human genome to completely uh, eradicate. However, with uh, uh, the increased investment and more uh, uh, scientific research, we may never, uh, despite, you know, we may never eradicate the virus. We may able to develop uh, drugs that can functionally cure, reach a functional cure of the disease. 
So that means you know you don't need a, a tax uh, antiviral drug for life with uh, 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 you know affinity therapy within a few months or even shorter. You can uh, you know uh, re uh, revoke the immune response that can control the residual infection. So then you have a peace of life. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And well, we look forward to hearing more from uh, you and your colleagues in, about the science, the current science, in just a bit. Um, before we turn to Dr. Cohen to share a little bit about the public health work at the foundation, I just wanted to address a question since one more one question that came through the chat um, about investments, since you know we're talking about that's what's needed to really accelerate for a cure. How much is needed in investments for research? Someone's asking, is it in the millions, hundreds of millions or billions? We, uh, I, sh Dr. Cohen might want to answer that. We actually put through uh, a kind of a roadmap to a cure and, and to try to price things out relative to, to, um, to uh, uh, other, other areas. And it really comes in two parts. There's a basic science investment, and then there's a clinical phase investment. I, I, I can't remember offhand, maybe Sherry does, uh, the, the cost to get to a cure of, of, uh, uh, of, um, of HCV. We did, we did actually do a little white paper on that uh, for the NIH at one time, and um, it's in the it's in the multi billions of dollars for sure. But it, in terms of basic science research, we actually did kind of price that out, and that's available somewhere. But it's in the I, I would say it's in in the uh, from the NIH it should be in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year, and then companies get involved and they really add to that. But Chair, do you remember what what we wrote? I can look up the actual number, but it, but it was in the low hundreds. Yeah. Yeah, but I will tell you this. Um, it is pretty amazing to me. The Hepatitis B Foundation for years was the high, uh, the place where there was the nonprofit highest concentration of, of, of um, research scientists looking at a basic science approach of, of, of hepatitis B cure. And, you know, we're, we're a reasonably small organization. Once a company picks it up or the NIH picks it up, it really multiplies in dollars. But, um, so, but, but it's in that, mm -hmm. typically they say to get a drug from, from discovery to approval is a billion dollars or more. And, but of course you need multiple shots on that goal. And, and we did the kind of math and it comes out, I don't wanna scare people, but it, it, comes, it comes out into the billions. But the basic science component of it, uh, the kind of Dr. Guo part where he discovers a new hit, a new drug, a new method, that's, um, oh, well, we're having a sale on that. This summer. I mean, that, that, that's, that's actually the least expensive part of the whole process. It, it probably represents two or three percent of the cost. So, so Tim, our professional, um, our professional judgment budget that we estimated for basic science was two hundred and thirty-two million over five or six years for the basic science oh, to, thanks. to there develop you go. the cure, yeah. functional cure. Thank you, thank you, Sherry. You're great, Sherry. Is all. Thank you, and we're we're definitely happy to share that uh, roadmap to a cure uh, with everyone. So, I wanted to. Um, talk about public health. Um, so Dr. Cohen, uh, who has hepatitis B around the world and, and why does the distribution look the way it does? Great question. Thank you, Kate. Um, so about 300 million people worldwide have chronic hepatitis B infection and more have recovered from acute infection. So if you think about that, that huge number, I know it's hard to wrap your head around that kind of number, but 300 million people having one disease, that it's one of the most common infections in the world. Um, and if you compare, it's more people, you know, more people have chronic hepatitis B than HIV and hep C and malaria and TB. However, um, as you know, it, it doesn't get nearly as much attention. And we'll talk a little bit about, about why that is. But um, hepatitis B is a problem worldwide. It is a problem in, in um, almost all regions of the world around the globe. Some areas of the world are more impacted by the virus than others. And, and that's a function of a few things. One is the virus is ancient. We have evidence that the virus has been around for thousands of years. Um, and so when you have ancient civilizations, civilizations in areas of the world where people have been in those areas longer than others, then you know they kind of, those civilizations grew up with the virus. And because the virus is transmitted from mother to child, because of the blood exchange at childbirth, you can wind up with the virus that's passed down generation to generation to generation, impacting more and more people with each generation. And then, of course, you know, over the last 40 years around the world, we have tried, or 30 years, we've tried to implement the hepatitis B vaccine widely. But of course, the vaccine has been implemented in some places more and better than other places. And so we tend to see 
a, tr a lowering trend where in some areas of the world, we're starting to see the chronic hepatitis B infections go down a little bit. Um, and that's because they're using the hepatitis B birth dose appropriately, making sure that babies are getting in, getting vaccinated at birth. Uh, but that's not used nearly as much. And so we honestly haven't seen the number of chronic infections go down all that much. And we're, st we're still seeing new infections. But we're see what you see is a globe that's highly, highly impacted by hepatitis B. So if, if we are seeing a globe that's highly impacted with millions of people, nearly 300 million, you know, that's a lot of people, that's more than malaria. Why don't we hear more about it in the news? Why don't we hear more about hepatitis B? Why aren't foundations like philanthropy paying more attention, like AIDS, for example? Why are they not talking about hepatitis B? Yeah, I ask myself that question every day. And sometimes I want to sort of, you know, bang on people's doors and why are you talking about hepatitis B? Um, so, you know, I think there's a couple things at play and we've done a lot of research and others have done research in this area. Number one is stigma. Hepatitis B is a highly stigmatized disease. Um, and for that reason, a lot of communities that are impacted by hepatitis B don't want to talk about it. It's not something that people are shouting from the rooftops. So we, unfortunately, we don't have, we have not benefited from having a large vocal community around the world who, who are advocating for themselves and others who are demanding attention. Um, we have we could learn from a lot of other communities like the HIV community and the breast cancer community. There are some communities that are, they have been incredible advocators and they have found ways to overcome stigma and to, to advocate for themselves, to prioritize their, their condition. We have not yet come, been able to do that, although we're starting, we're starting to see people more willing to talk about hepatitis B, which is great. I think part of the other problem is, um, it's a silent disease that can take 40 to 50 years for people to develop symptoms and unfortunately to die from it. And so I think people, scientists, foundations, legislators, government officials sometimes think that it's not as important because it's not gonna kill you tomorrow, right? And so it's a, it's a terrible thing to say, but it's people look pretty good when they have hepatitis B until they don't. And so I think sometimes that makes it less prioritized. Um, I also think that, um, while one of the most, one of the, the best things we have is a vaccine that can prevent new infections, unfortunately, people view it as a preventable disease, that it's vaccine preventable. And so because it's vaccine preventable, a lot of decision makers and stakeholders forget about the fact that there are still 300 million people who have hepatitis B and for them, the vaccine won't work. And so I think people have, the paradigm has been, let's prevent new infections, which is very important, but that's taken away attention from the fact that there are still people who have it. And so it's just become, it's sort of a triple whammy where you have a, um, you know, this cycle of deprioritization of a very important disease. Thank you. So um, I heard once someone say that once a cure is found, maybe it was you, um, that's when the work of the Hepatitis B Foundation really begins. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, I think it was me. It's funny because people always say to me, oh, when they find a cure, you guys can all go home. And I'm like, oh my gosh, when they find a cure, we're going to have to work double. Um, so what we're doing now is, is getting, the ready, getting the world ready for a cure. Right now, we have a situation where only 10% of people worldwide have even been diagnosed. And so millions of people need to get diagnosed and into care. Well, there are so many challenges and obstacles and barriers that have to be overcome and infrastructure that has to be built in order to get people to a place where if we had a cure, if we have a cure, a functional cure in five years or 10 years, who's gonna get it when nobody is diagnosed and those that are diagnosed don't have access to sustainable care and treatment. So it's our job to build that infrastructure and to make sure that people have access to diagnosis and care and treatment and support and everything they need. Um, so once we have a cure, it'll be our job to make sure that the that all of the places in the world are ready for it. And we've seen we've seen it with it, with Hep C. You know, the hepatitis C world. Uh, our partners are incredibly lucky and grateful that they have a cure. However, very few people have access to it right now. We're seeing it steadily increase, but the the disease didn't disappear just because they had a cure. I think it's the public health infrastructure that then has to make sure people get it. Thank you. So, you know, you talked about 
the work of the foundation, what we need to mobilize and make sure that people have access to the care and the treatments once they're available. Like how, how is the foundation ensuring that people, um, not only people with hepatitis B, but allies and our partners and everyone are engaged in the global movement to, to increase access and eliminate hepatitis B? We, um, it's, it's, it's a challenge. We're trying very hard. So I think one of the things we're doing is actively working to eliminate stigma and discrimination around the world. Because I think if we can, if we can address some of the stigma and discrimination, then people will feel more comfortable and freer coming out and talking about hepatitis B and engaging with us and demanding action. Um, we have a stigma and discrimination registry. So if, if people are feeling just have been discriminated against around the world because of their hepatitis B, they can register with us and we will, um, we're taking what we learned so that we can go back to countries and, and try and impact change, to try and change country level policy to end discrimination. We have our nationwide and our global storytelling program where people can share their stories with us and widely to help educate others and to help people feel free and comfortable talking about their hepatitis B. Um, we have, our community advisory boards that we're going to be launching this summer, those are global, we are, where we will have representatives from all of the WHO regions who will be talking with each other and with scientists and drug developers and clinical trial developers and communities who will be the sort of the, the people on the street to start engaging with others and helping, uh, helping prioritize hepatitis B among all the stakeholders. Um, we have an advocacy, an advocacy and a grassroots program. I think the, the message here is that everyone can participate whatever level they want to, from as simple as putting an electronic signature on a letter to making a video, to sharing their story, to just following us on social media, um, to being on an advisory board. So if you go to our website or you follow us on social media or you email us, we can help you figure out the best way to be engaged. But I think the key is that everyone has to be engaged because let's face it, we are, we're 10 people. We can't, we can't save the world without everybody in it with us. Yeah, that's a good point. We, we need everyone. And I'm going to throw a question in there that probably wasn't, that wasn't in the but uh, you know, as we're transitioning to the to the science in a few minutes, I wanted to ask maybe all three of you, how can we get everyone involved and make that link between scientists, science and public health so that stakeholders from both communities are, you know, are, you know, adding to that voice, the advocacy voice for hepatitis B. I, I can start and then and then please, please feel feel free to jump in. I think Kate, you you hit on something very important that I unfortunately ha I think happens quite a lot. Um, the scientific world, the clinical world, and the public health world we've been siloed for quite a while and don't always bring each other to the table. I think we need to sit together and and um, understand each other, and that's one of the benefits of having the Hep B Foundation and the Blumberg Institute together because. Uh, we in the public health world, we have the scientists right down the hall. So we can talk to them so that we can better understand what's happening for cure research. And then we can translate it to the people living with Hep B. But what we need is the other way too, right? So we need the scientists and the clinicians to understand what the public health challenges and barriers are so that their world can open up a little bit too. I think we need to break down the silos and have everybody at the table. If um, So I guess my advice would be for drug developers, for bench scientists, for clinicians, if you are thinking, if you're engaged in hepatitis B research, bring people to the table, people who have hepatitis B, people who care about hep hepatitis B. Um, it doesn't have to be us at the foundation. There are lots of people out there, but I would say bring people to the table. Nothing to add. Well said, Sherry. Thank you. Hey, there was a, a, a good question in the chat bar from Kendra. Yes. Um, yeah, Sherry, you, thank you. You talked about stigma before as, you know, one of the major reasons why we're not talking about hepatitis B. There's not enough attention. And, and the question is, do we have any resources for tactical ways we can reduce stigma? And then just to add on to that, um, someone asking us, you know, how do we report stigma? stigmatization of heavy patients or someone who's experiencing stigma or discrimination? Yeah, so um, I will put the, one of us can put the link in the chat box to the discrimination registry. 
You can also just email info at heppy.org, which I know we've put in the chat. And if you're if you've experienced stigma or discrimination and you want to share it with us, email us and we'll we'll help. We'll, we will find a way to document it and to help however we can. Um, so I think um, I'm sorry. What was the original question? It was Ta tactical ways tactical to, ways to uh, reduce okay. stigma. So so here's the bottom line is people need to be able to talk openly and have open, honest conversations about hepatitis B. That's the way that you reduce stigma is to talk about it. I mean, things stay closeted and secret when no one wants to talk about them. So if we can get people with hepatitis B and people like us working in hepatitis B to go into our communities and our families and our friends and online and social media, if we can talk about hep B and start sharing correct information about it, we will, it will, be, what will happen is stigma will decrease. That's, that's the way to do it. And at the same time, our job is to go to the key stakeholders and the policymakers and the decision makers and, and end discrimination, sanction discrimination. If we can help people who can't get jobs because they have hep B, you know, when you do those two things at the same time, so you guys talk about hep B, we'll work on the policy together, and then we can end it that way. But the only way to do it is to to make it take it out of the shadows and bring it into the light. Absolutely, thank you. And uh, the link to the discrimination registry, which is one way to report discrimination um, and issues related to stigma, is in the chat box. Thank you, Jean. Great. So let's turn it turn to our attention to the science a little bit, um, Tim. Uh, and, and Dr. Um, Gua and um, Dr. Shrestha and Elizabeth, feel free to chime in. Um, why is hepatitis B such a difficult disease to cure? You touched on this a little bit, but if you wanted to expand on it some more. Juto, did you want, I mean, I, I, no, you I've said ahead. why. You go ahead. Well, I, I, I answered that already as best I can. I think that on, on one hand, I think it's a met. So we, I've said that with enough, enough investment that we'd make a lot more advanced. But hepatitis B is difficult because one, one I do think it's been underinvested in and, and we're now just learning things that, 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 that make it, we're learning new vulnerabilities, but it's become pretty clear that hepatitis B is different than hepatitis C and even different from COVID. Because hepatitis B is a chronic infection. Most people who are infected were infected at birth or near birth. Uh, the virus has paralyzed our immune system so there's not a, what I'll call a beneficial immunological response to it. There's only a bad immunological response to it in people who are chronically infected. The virus hides in your liver cells. Uh, it's, it's chromosome, it, it's, it is, is in your nucleus in this, this, this very durable thing called a covalently closed circle. And then, and then sometimes even the virus chromosome integrates into your DNA. So even if you got rid of the, that, CCC DNA, it, it, it still have the integrants and it pumps out a huge amount of viral protein uh, uh, and, and, and our immune systems seem to be uh, of those who are chronically infected. I don't wanna say helpless, but they just are very passive in there. So if you're going to get, so it's, it's, so it's a, a different virology, it's a different immunology uh, than, um, than, than most of these other viruses. So you can shut the virus down, keep it from replicating a lot by hitting it at its replication. That's what those oral medications do. The tenofovirus, the ten, the uh, the uh, entecovirus, <clears throat> the lamivudines, they do a good job of that. But then the virus still continues to kind of pump out from its CCC DNA or its integrants. And so um, that's what the Blumberg Institute science is all based at. And, and I, I hope, uh, I want to leave enough time for Dr. Go to talk about some of these new approaches that we're taking at the Blumberg Institute. The Blumberg Institute has a small number of scientists, but we're all dedicated uh, uh, at looking for cures for hepatitis B and liver cancer. And and we, <clears throat> meaning Guo and 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 the uh, and the other scientists here, but led by Dr. Guo, have identified new vulnerabilities that we hope are going to complement those drugs that are out there. And then and then reach development. So that, that I think, I mean, we're thinking about this every day and thinking about new ways of stimulating the immune system and while well, whacking down, down the virus. Juta, do you want you to? Uh, thank you, Jim. Yeah. I uh, continue and on this. And I just started uh, 
to you know tell you a little story that uh, you know in the early 80s when i in medical school we learned the uh, antiviral drugs that's only about three drugs that's in the textbook that tells us that virus is an intracellular parasite that is so difficult to select to kill the virus without hurt cells that's not as easy as you just develop antibiotics to control the bacterial infection. The virus disease is so difficult to treat. However, due to when the, uh, especially, you know, when the HIV uh, pandemic was uh, appears, there's a lot of the, uh, invest, investigation on the viral replication have been uh, supported as a basic research. And the people soon found that the virus replication rely on certain viral protein to support. And the people soon learned how you can not only just uh, develop small molecules to inhibit viral uh, enzyme, protease, uh, polymerase, integrase, right? And we also can even target previously considered that untargetable protein, like capsid protein, like uh, emerald protein. So that tell us, you know, despite compare other virus, HPV replication and uh, uh, interaction with host cells and the immune system, that really puts a challenge for us to manage it. However, sufficient, you know, uh, basic research will find a trick that you can target and you can cure. So that's I strongly believe it. That's is actually what the uh, underlying philosophers support us to keep fighting, keep finding the, the, you know, how the viral replicates uh, and uh, how the interaction with the immune uh, system. And uh, all this molecular basis we found that will contribute to our de uh, design uh, strategy to uh, fight the virus and uh, control the virus infection. So, uh, you know, uh, about uh, a few years ago, we uh, published a paper and tried to, you know, based on our understanding, we propose, you know, it's tech what to really cure uh, HPV infection. We think that that's one pill we're not going to do it, or it's one, tag, uh, one viral protein will not uh, uh, without a cure. So what we need is actually a combination or sequential combination therapy. So first, you need to stop viral replication. So currently, we do have a, a drug that polymerase inhibitor we know as nukes that can potentially support, uh, 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 suppress viral genome replication. Of course, we know that maybe they're going to suppress more than 99% of replication, but still not enough. So now have an additional viral replication inhibitor like uh, you know, compound target capsid that is in uh, phase two clinical trial. So I will uh, tell you a little bit of uh, those things later. And also other uh, drugs target viral RNA that's also going to contribute suppress viral replication. So after you squeeze viral suppress viral replication down to a very low level, so then you can actually try to find a way to reboot the immune response and to control the residual infection. And once the antiviral immune response was finally established, so then you will have a peace of mind, just like you have a uh, acute infection and the immune uh, system will control the well, rest of you will have a, you know, a health, a healthy life. You know. So this is a, a general strategy. So uh, in our institute, so what's, how we achieve this goal? So as a virologist, in the first 20 years of my career, I, I mainly you know, study how the virus replicates themselves how the virus causes the disease. And uh, when I joined the uh, uh, you know, Drexel University Medical School and then uh, Blomberg uh, Institute. So, you know, work with team, we actually, you know, use the, uh, our understanding about viral replication and develops the new assays 
so we can find the new drugs. So basically, the new drug we discovered here that was really different from the uh, uh, general ph pharmaceutical company, because that's, you know, we are small institutes. We have a very limited infrastructure, like big pharma. They can screen the compounds, uh, screening uh, uh, millions of compounds within, uh, within a month. So we don't have that. However, we always, based on our understanding, how our replicates, how our you know, uh, uh, you know, interaction with the host cell, we develop some very unique assay to find the compounds and uh, then further develop. That was actually how we get uh, discovered the first uh, uh, you know, uh, a bona fide uh, capsid uh, assembly modulator, or generally called capsid inhibitor. So with our discovery, that's not, that's in our original screening, we, we found a three class compounds that each have been developed by ourselves and also other companies into three classes of the uh, compounds that all reach the uh, first two clinical trials now. So, uh, so that's, uh, I believe, you know, is a one of the unique contribution. You know, another thing that was uh, uh, like CCCD, I actually spent a lot, uh, a significant amount of time in my career to understand how the CCCD was made and how the CCCD was uh, uh, activated by, uh, to transcribe the viral protein to support the replication. And if there is a chance, you can actually uh, find a way to inactivate CCDNA or totally eliminate. So despite, you know, for this one, it's, it's really tough. But in the recent years, we really found some uniqueness about this, how that's the CCDNA different from our host chromosome DNA. So that's, you know, will allow us to develop something unique and can control as well replication, uh, uh, can cure. So uh, finally, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the new uh, technology we are currently developed in our institute. So again, you know, uh, we, beside the capsid compounds, we are still looking for more, uh, you know, unique compounds that target the core protein and uh, not only just inhibit viral replication, that can re, uh, induce a viral protein degradation. So that is our current goal. And that was supported by the NIH grants, the DOD uh, grants. And we also try to target something that currently no pharmaceutical co company have able to directly do that. So one is about e editing. It's a viral protein similar with core protein, but that suppress immune response. We hope by suppress this protein secretion, that will help the immune response to restore and control the viral replication. And another one is that the surface editing. That is the pro viral protein is huge amounts in the uh, uh, you know the patient's blood. That's suppress immune response that is considered to be required to elimination of this protein is required for the uh, functional cure. So we have identified key structure components that are essential for those protein to secrete from the uh, uh, hepatocytes. And uh, uh, you know, we have developed the assay and currently you know, uh, looking for the new drugs to target. That's the project is led by uh, Dr. Schrader and uh, you know, uh, Lauren have also actively participated into this project. So uh, I would like uh, uh, Dr. Freiter to uh, uh, introduce about this project. Yeah. Sure, uh, thank you, Dr. Go. So like Dr. Go said, uh, out of several projects uh, that is being done in our lab, uh, currently myself and Lauren, uh, we have been working on a project uh, where we are trying to explore the possibility of the functional cure for the HPV. So uh, and in order to achieve that, uh, uh, we are screening hundreds and thousands of compounds uh, from our compound libraries that we have in the Bloomberg Institute. Uh, that might target the HPV about particles like uh, uh, HPSAG, that is the surface antigen and E antigen, and inhibits it, its production, uh, morphogenesis, and its degradation. Uh, so. Uh, 
Also, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, one of uh, our donors whose generous funding has made this work possible. And we are really uh, looking forward with some uh, exciting uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Lauren. Hey everyone, um, I'm Lauren Griffith. I'm a junior research scientist for Dr. Chong and Dr. Guo's lab. Um, I started about a year ago after I graduated from my master's degree, which actually took place at the Pennsylvania Biotech Center, um, and where I was also able to volunteer with the Hepatitis B Foundation, which uh, definitely piqued my interest into viral drug discovery research. Um, but what I can say is that even though I've been with the Institute for such a short period of time, uh, working at the Blumberg Institute has been very life-changing for me um, as this environment just really fosters innovation um, and education, which has been really crucial in my professional development, as well as the future of medicine. Um, so in my uh, position, I've been able to be involved with a couple different uh, viral drug discovery research projects. However, um, the project that is most exciting for me is the one that Biblov had just mentioned, um, in which uh, we are working with Dr. Guo on screening thousands of compounds for hepatitis B virus uh, surface antigen inhibition. Uh, so basically what this means is that over the last few months, Biblov and I have been working with a liver cell line. Um, and what's so special about this cell line is that it's able to produce the hepatitis uh, B surface antigen. Uh, so when we are pulling compounds uh, from the compound library that's here at the Institute, we are then treating these cells with those compounds and then detecting if there is a decrease in that surface antigen uh, production, um, which is super exciting exciting for maybe possibly finding a functional cure. Um, even though we are in the initial stages of this project, I'm very optimistic um, for what is to come in the future, um, as the next steps will include screening compounds for different uh, factors, such as dose response and toxicity, as well as validating uh, these results on different cell lines. Um, so it is really exciting and I, it is very optimistic for the future, but I also wanted to extend uh, my gratitude to all of you for your generous donations, um, as they're definitely making a difference in supporting the critical research that is being done for the hepatitis community. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank so you, much. Uh, and uh, uh, Lauren. So yeah. uh, especially, you know, uh, Lauren, that's as a uh, uh, new uh, beginner uh, investigator, you know, that's really uh, let me recollect why I get into uh, graduate school and uh, start lab work. You know, it's every day is kind of exciting. You know, it's uh, you are, you are uh, uh, learning things. So that's it's really, you know, you can uh, see that we have the, um, uh, you know, the workforce from the well experienced uh, virologist, uh, you know, chemist, drug developer, and also the postal graduate students, and also, you know, the, uh, have, uh, you know, the, the variety of, uh, you know, people have been involved in this. Thank you, Dr. Guo and Lauren and Dr. Tressa. It's it's just amazing to hear all the promising and exciting work that's being done in the labs. Um, you know, I, I wanted to turn to a question that came up in the chat box um, and make sure we address it before we run out of time. Um, is there any effort being made to, to enable how hepatitis B to enable hepatitis B patients to have access to free testing and medication or at least um, affordable medication? I'm so glad someone asked that question. So there are a number of things that we're trying to do um, and hoping that if we cast our net wide and we, we try a lot of different strategies that something will take. Um, so globally, there are a number of countries that are, that are working on viral hepatitis elimination plans. Um, some countries are including hepatitis B in those elimination plans, some are not. So one of the things we are doing is advocating globally and working with global partners to try and ensure that every country that has an elimination plan for viral hepatitis includes hepatitis B and that those countries then fund those elimination plans. Um, and so basically it is advocating to make sure that countries provide 
free or reduced te cost testing for hepatitis B and or free and redu or reduced cost ac accessible treatment. And so um, what that means, and I know I keep saying this, but it, it means that we will need people in those countries to help us and to speak up and, and help prioritize and publicize hepatitis B to make sure that they're putting pressure on their own government officials. You have to put pressure on your leaders to, to pay for this and to fund and make sure that treatment is accessible. Um, we are also, I think, working with other global partners to put pressure to make sure that hepatitis B vaccine is accessible, especially for infants and newborns so that we can prevent new infections. And that means working with um, Gavi and the Gates Foundation, the World Health Alliance, World Hepatitis Alliance, World Health Organization to make sure that um, there is accessible hepatitis B vaccine in, in especially in, in limited resource countries so that we can prevent new infections into the future. Because birth dose of hepatitis B is, is not accessible in every country. And a lot of babies are being born to moms who have hep B and they're not getting the protection they need. And we could save those lives. Um, we, in the, we do have a pretty robust program in the United States as well, where we are working on, um, in many, many states on discriminatory drug pricing and working with partners, government officials, state officials around the country to try and ensure that hepatitis B antivirals remain accessible. I know someone also put in a question about, about HIV, sort of comparing it to HIV, where HIV testing and HIV medication is free around the world, and why don't we have that for Hep B? Man, is that a good question. I think uh, the amount of funding that's been put into HIV, we will never see for any other disease. That just won't happen. Um, it's not sustainable, and it wouldn't be sustainable for anything else. Um, however, that doesn't mean that there aren't things we can do. Um, if we put pressure on industry and governments and large funders as well. I mean, I think we need to put pressure on large foundations as well to help fund hepatitis B treatment. And not only treatment, Sherry, I thank you. I, I echo everything Sherry said, but also um, anyone who is chronically infected with hepatitis B, even if on treatment, uh, the antivirals, need screening for other advanced liver disease. And that is, is undercovered as well. And and uh, underused. And we just convened a workshop here with 23 leading hepatologists and oncologists from, from around the country and, and world at the met at the Hepatitis B Foundation. And it was really shocking to see how little, how underused screening is for liver cancer. So that's also an important uh, component of, um, of, of, of eliminating hepatitis B and the problems associated with it. Thank you. Uh, and a reminder for the audience, if, if you have a questions, please feel free to continue typing them into the chat box. Um, so I'm um, going back uh, to some uh, something that uh, a few of you have mentioned, um, you know, around this, our journey to our cure, as you would say. The question I'm, everyone wants to know is one, when can we expect a cure, do you think? Um, and then a couple of you recently mentioned a functional cure. What is that exactly? Yeah, I, I want to quickly weigh in on the the, the cure the cure terminology. Um, so, in my mind, and we introduced this a number of years ago in a publication, a definition of a cure for me, and I think most patients would be would be that you are free of the disease. Your risk of of of, of disease is no different than someone who doesn't have hepatitis B, and that's not what really is being to, to know that. Uh, because the, the, the course of hepatitis B takes 10, 20, 30 years in most people. So to know that from a drug would be um, very difficult to prove. So we can't wait for that. So people, experts have come up with these other definitions such as functional cure. And so that's supposed to be equivalent to, uh, to predict the kind of outcome that I'm talking about. Uh, uh, reducing, greatly reducing the risk of serious liver disease, a functional cure than something that can be measured in a reasonably short period of time. And it generally means to me, and it, there are different definitions that, that off, uh, you're off a drug, you're off the drug, but you have a sustained, what they call virological response. The virus is suppressed and ideally S antigen is, is gone and hopefully S antibody appears. And that's kind of the situation that someone who has what is called a resolved infection would have. And that, it, and that's, that's what is meant by a functional cure. We try away from saying cure because the cure, as I've mentioned, would take um, decades to really know if, if the drug did that. So that's what a functional cure. How far are we from that? 
Uh, I think obviously it's a, it's a function of investment versus time, and 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 those are it's like a one multiplied by the other, and you can raise one or reduce the other. Um, and 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 I think that in the next few years we're going to see some very uh, important new drugs come on. I don't th think they will be the last drugs because, as you heard Dr. Guo talk about, the we there we need to develop more drugs that pump up the immune system and whack down. Or is that we're we're uh, certainly years away from that. But in the next few years, I, I hope to see, we already saw Merclinics be approved for Hep D. I think we're gonna see some new drugs approved for Hep B. I don't think they will be the final drugs. They will be improvements like, remember with Hep C, with Hep C, they started with the first drugs in, in the, in the uh, early uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And that, that, that brought 5% more people into the, what you'd call the cure. And then, it, then another few years, another drug came out, and it was another 15%. And every few years you had another great entry and until finally now hepatitis C is cured with, uh, with um, just a short course of therapy. But that took, that took 15, 20 years of significant investment. I think we're gonna see the same thing with B. Thank you, Dr. Bach. Uh, Dr. Gore, did you wanna add any? Thank yes, uh, so I, I think that uh, based on the current uh, clinical trial, so the uh, 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 capsid inhibitor, some of the capsid inhibitor, and also the srRNA, that's direct target viral RNA, that's have a chance to be approved with the next few years. So does that work together with current standard of care like Nuke? That will give you a, a functional cure. It's uh, questionable because uh, you know they, they, they are not going to uh, you know revoke the immune response. So so basically, currently there uh, uh, is several strategies that have been tried to restore the host uh, antiviral immune response against HPV. So that may take more than five years, at least more than five years. We see the uh, you know. Uh, which strategy will going to be, going to be work? So uh, one thing I want to add on is that you know uh, previously I just uh, tell about the uh, antiviral drugs we develop as a small molecule approach, the common small molecule drugs. So currently in Bloomberg Institutes we have also developed the mRNA based uh, uh, drugs that. Uh, is just like a, a COVID vaccine. So, so we try to develop this uh, kind of new vaccine that uh, induce the immune re response in the uh, current hepatitis B patients. We also, you know, have other platform use a new biotechnology uh, platform try to develop a new strategy of therapy. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Guo. Well, we have learned so much. I think all of you have really painted a really um, comprehensive picture of, of your journey um, in the path to a cure from the science as well as from the public health and advocacy side. So thank you so much for uh, sharing your perspectives and, and history and knowledge with us today. Um, and I'm gonna turn it back to Jean to wrap up. Thank you, Kate, for moderating, and um, thank you to uh, all of our distinguished panelists today. Um, and obviously, thanks to everyone uh, for participating in today's webinar for the, the really great questions. Um, I saw another question that just came in, and I think Sherry attempted to, to answer that. But um, again, you can always uh, email us at info at hepb.org with additional questions. Uh, we're always here for you. Um, a couple takeaways for me today. Um, obviously, you know, we heard from Dr. Cohen and uh, from Dr. Su Wong in the, in the intro, um, and really from everyone that we need to bring hepatitis B out of the shadows. Um, and we need to, 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 for people to join the fight, to, to be loud and make our voices heard. Um, and then of course, the other pretty obvious uh, takeaway is is investment, investment, investment. Um, you know whether that's um, uh, donations from individuals or uh, encouraging um, our governments and and our legislators to to get behind this. Um, I'm very hopeful 
that uh, a, a cure for this disease will be found in our lifetime and save millions of lives, but we need to make a lot of noise. Uh, we have to do all we can to support the science from Dr. Guo's labs and Dr. Cohen's public health programs. Like she said, once we have a cure, that's when the work really begins. And I think that question came from me when I, when I first joined the organization four years ago. <laughs> uh, but thank you to everyone uh, for being here today. If you can give, please do. Um, I'm gonna bring up a slide with some information uh, that might help you to uh, um, understand what you can do yourself. Um, and um, you know, if you wanna learn more, go to our website, hepb.org. If you wanna donate, you can go to hepb.org slash donate. Um, if you wanna be one of our champions and give monthly, you can go to hepb.org slash champions. We're actually going to be in the New York City Marathon this year, which is really exciting. You can get more information at hepb.org slash NYC dash marathon. Um, and you can also contact me directly at giving at hepb.org or call the phone number there at 215-489-4946. Uh, but again, I want to thank everyone for, for being here today and caring. Um, and uh, uh, have a great rest of your weekend. And thanks again, everyone. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you.